So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Dario Bassani, who is our WIND seminar speaker today. Uh, Dr. Bassani is a senior scientist at the Institut des Sciences Moléculaires at the University of Bordeaux in France. He was born in Milan, Italy, and studied at the Catholic University of uh, Louvain in Belgium, obtaining his undergraduate degree in chemistry with grand distinction in 1988. He then did a very productive PhD at uh, Northwestern University in the USA, working with Professor F.D. Lewis. <coughs> Following that, he spent two years uh, I think it was two years as a Pierre and, and Marie Curie research fellow with Nobel laureate uh, mm -hmm. Jean-Marie Lane. Was it two years? Or? Two years. Two years, yeah. At Strasbourg, working in the area of supramolecular chemistry. And he began his, uh, his career at the CNRS as a chargé de recherche, first class, and was appointed as director of research in 2005. Uh, Dr. Bassani's uh, research program bridges photochemistry and uh, supramolecular chemistry and he designed systems that undergo self-assembly into photoactive architectures endowed with specific functionalities. These include molecular recognition and sensing, photocatalysis, and supramolecular materials for optoelectronic applications such as high-definition OLED devices uh, or displays and solar photo photovoltaics. He's also exploring uh, adaptive materials capable of self-healing and autonomic regulation. Dr. Bassani has 73 papers to his credit in refereed journals and three books, uh, three book chapters that he's contributed to. He has won several awards, including the 2005 Swiss Chemical Society Neumann Prize, the 2004 French Chemical Society Physical Chemistry Division Award, and he won a 2003 Inter-American Photochemical Society Young Investigator Award. In January 2015, he will be taking over as editor-in-chief for the RSC journal, Photochemical and Photobiological Sciences. So please welcome Dr. Dario Bassan. Thank you very much. That's a very exhaustive introduction. I hope I still have some things I can tell you that, uh, that you don't know already. Uh, first of all, well, thank you very much, Arthur and uh, Yuning, for uh, giving me the opportunity and arranging this visit uh, that I could see and meet some of the faculty here and also visit the new building. I came here actually uh, four years ago and this was still a hole in the ground. Uh, well, it's come a long way since and congratulations to all of you for, for making it in such a wonderful research environment. Um, I tried to combine a few things in the research that we do. As you hear, as you just heard, well, what we do spans quite a lot of topics and uh, I won't have time or probably you don't have the energy to listen to all of these things today. So I, I chose just a few things that I thought would probably interest people here more um, on the grounds that these are topics that are related maybe to uh, materials, to devices, and to uh, electronic properties. And one of the things that I've, I've always noticed has, has been a recurring theme in all of the things that we do, and it's a common um, occupational hazard of people that do organic material, is how do we manage to get molecules to talk to one another? How can we make the molecules communicate uh, so that they can um, transfer the information that they feel onto the next door neighbor? Uh, the reason why we're interested in this, of course, is that single molecule devices are fantastic. They're about as small as you can make them, uh, and they may have room uh, in the future for, there may be room in the future for these type of uh, devices. Uh, however, for now, uh, we're still contemplating few molecule devices or sort of uh, molecular assembly devices. So what we are interested in or what I'm interested in and what I'd like to talk to you about today is how we can control self-assembly uh, and use this to direct the way that the uh, electronic uh, properties of the material unfold. And as you can imagine, well, this has uh, implications for well, photovoltaic devices, but also optical information uh, processes and, um, and molecular electronics in general, really. Um, the idea of self-assembly is something that we've known for many decades now. Uh, molecules come together through intermolecular forces. Uh, intermolecular forces span the very strong, like metal coordination, uh, to the very weak, like uh, Van der Waals forces, right? Things that come and go. 
so as I was saying, we have very strong uh, intermolecular forces and we have very uh, weak intermolecular forces. Uh, by and large, these are the ones that the organic chemists will tend to play with, hydrogen bonding, pi stacking, hydrophobic interactions. Uh, of these, uh, the ones that we've been concentrating upon are, of course, the pi stacking, because this mediates electronic communication, and also hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding, as I'm going to show, has significant advantages in that we can control the directionality, the complementarity, and also the force of the interactions. And we can do this by combining different uh, hydrogen bonding donor acceptor sites, much the same way natural biopolymers like DNA do to be able to achieve complementary recognition. Uh, there's an added advantage to hydrogen bonds is that they don't absorb UV light. So for a photochemist and a spectroscopist like me, this is important. Uh, and they're also uh, electrochemically inert. In other words, they do not affect the uh, electronic properties of the material. Uh, what I'll also be presenting today is something that's rather new in the field of molecular, supermolecular chemistry, which is the use of reversible covalent bonds. Now, you might say, well, covalent bonds is not supramolecular chemistry anymore, right? If you make a covalent bond, well, then it's uh, not intermolecular anymore, it's intramolecular. And I totally agree with you. Uh, however, uh, there's many non-covalent bonds that are just as strong as covalent bonds. For example, coordinative bonds between metal uh, and, a, and a ligand. Um, so if we consider those to be supramolecular, well, why not these? And in the end, what is really important here is the reversibility. The fact that the covalent bonds can unform and reform, and if they do so sufficiently quickly, and I'm thinking maybe imine formation, but as I'll show you, that's not what I have in mind right now, uh, we can actually control the stability, which could be perhaps kinetic rather than thermodynamic. So this gives us temporal control over what's being formed. Uh, it is, of course, and this can be a plus or a disadvantage, depending on how you use it. Uh, it can be sensitive to conditions. Uh, and this, in general, uh, attracted us because it's useful for when you're missing uh, reactive functional groups. So what am I going to show you today? Well, essentially, maybe three things I'd really like to go over. One is a discovery that we made, and this is something that's actually, I find, fairly rare for a scientist to actually say, well, we discovered something. Um, mostly you find what you predict. And so we fell on these photopolic materials, so I'd like to talk to you about those today. Um, and then the electronic properties of self-assembled fullerene monolayers. This is things that are made using this reversible covalent approach. Uh, and then again, the same was applied to graphene modification. If I have a little bit of time, because now we're already a little bit late, uh, I'll also show you some results that we have on the high-definition OLED devices. When we started this work, the motivation was to control reactivity in the excited state. And you can think, well, this is going to be difficult to do because excited states are very energetic. You have a lot of energy in a single excited state, maybe 70, 80 kilocals per mole. It is huge. How are you going to control that? Well, actually, you can. You can control it by pre-organizing the reagents before. So for example, if you use a metal ion and hydrogen bonding, you can actually join these two double bonds with very good control over the regio and stereo uh, the topology, we can say, of the, of the cyclobutane formation. Uh, and you can actually measure the catalytic acceleration rate. And you can see that it's actually very high, uh, over 3,000. Uh, it turned out that this is interesting, but you can actually apply it much more generally to anything that can be arranged uh, topochemically prior to the reaction, such as, for example, fullerene. And here we showed that we could actually catalyze the photo-induced dimerization of fullerene in solution, something that normally doesn't happen because fullerene, of course, is very insoluble, so there's just not enough of it in solution to be able to do any chemistry uh, on the excited state surface. Um, of course, this was the initial motivation, but as, you, as soon as we made this, uh, we immediately realized the potential, which is that, wow, if we can arrange the fullerenes, then we can control the way that they interact. We can align them, perhaps. We can put them into ribbons and achieve unidirectional charge transport. And so we did that, or at least we tried to do that. And this is essentially the work of a very bright uh, Taiwanese uh, graduate student that I had in my group, uh, Chu Chenche, uh, that you see here, uh, very happy. Uh, we had just managed, so Chu Chenche synthesized this fullerene derivative that you recognize has a C60 appended with a hydrogen bonding unit to be able to align it. And if you see on the back, in a position that doesn't matter too much, we put 
a bitter butophenyl compound to give it enhanced solubility. Now, it took us a few tries to figure out which uh, group to put there, uh, but once we had it, we were able to ob uh, obtain these crystals, uh, which showed very nicely, very gratifyingly, because of course you're always happy when you find what you're looking for, uh, the formation of hydrogen bonded ribbons in which all the fullerenes are aligned. And so not only are they aligned, but because the repetition distance of the hydrogen bonded ribbon is exactly one nanometer, they're all aligned and in close van der Waals contact with one another. So this is very nice. Uh, we have, of course, made fullerene cables. What are their ele electronic properties? Well, the electronic properties, as you can imagine, are those of an anisotropic fullerene. So fullerene crystallizes isotropically. Every fullerene sees identical space around it as every other fullerene. And fullerene will transport charges in any direction of space because it's an uh, isotropic material. This material, however, is strongly anisotropic. And so if you look at the charge carrier mobility, you find that the bulk charge carrier mobility is lower than that of C60 because precisely it can only transport charges along one direction. Uh, but this, of course, tells us some information, but it doesn't really tell us the information we want. What we want to know is, does it transport charges preferentially along one axis or not? And so we try to determine that by measuring the charge carrier mobility on a single crystal, the sort of thing that Zen and Bao does. Um, there's one problem with that, is that we're not Zen, I'm not Zen and Bao, as you can probably tell, and we just don't have the capability and the knowledge to be able to do this. Uh, we conceded defeat after maybe six or seven months of hard work. This is the type of things we're looking at. We're looking at a crystal that's maybe 100 microns in this direction. Uh, these are 40 micron um, electrodes that were deposited. Uh, we will take the contacts. Very difficult to obtain good measurements. So having established that we're not excellent in doing single crystal uh, conductivity measurements, uh, I went resorted to my background in spectroscopy, and the idea was perhaps we could use spectroscopy to determine if the electronic interactions were aligned in these crystals. And for that, we turned to fluorescence and isotropy. Um, maybe some of you are not familiar with this, but any organic chromophore that is non-symmetrical will emit polarized light. Now, normally you don't see this because the chromophores are turning and bouncing in solution. So when you take a solution fluorescence emission spectra, you just see non-polarized emission. However, if you can align the chromophores, like for example, if you can align the anthracene shown here, you will see that the singlet LB is polarized along the short axis of the molecule and the singlet LA band is polarized along the long axis of the molecule. And this is very typical of organic chromophores. So we could perhaps use this property to determine whether the C60 molecules are aligned. Of course, there's a problem with that. And the fact that C60 is completely spherical and is totally symmetric. So it has no polarized emission. How can we get orientational information from something that's a sphere? How do you know which way a sphere is pointing? Well, you can't, it's a sphere. But here's where things get interesting. Uh, and it gets interesting because C60, of course, in the solid doesn't emit from a single C60 molecule. It emits what we either can call it an exciton state, so a delocalized exciton over two or more C60. Or if you're more of a molecular photochemist like me, you would call it an excimer. An excimer emission can be polarized. So Burks showed already in the 1960s that you could get polarized excimer emission from pyrene crystals. And this is actually quite interesting because if we can look for excimer emission in these systems, then we can know which way the excimer is oriented. So can we use excimer emission to probe through space electronic interactions? So the first thing we did is to check on a control. We took a microcrystal of C60, uh, put it on a confocal fluorescence microscope that's equipped with uh, polarized emission and uh, uh, analysis and so this is the emission from the single crystal and what you find is that a single crystal of C60 has absolutely no polarization whatsoever so the light is not emitted uh, with any polarization. Now if you take the C60 material where you have the hydrogen bonding uh, adduct on it you see that once again we have emission from 
an eczema, so it's, this is the emission from the compound in solution. Eczema tends to be shifted to lower energy because the energy is delocalized over two molecules. So it's narrower and shifted to longer energy. And if we look at the polarization, we see that there is very strong polarization here from the emission. You can see this in the peanut-shaped emission, uh, emission plot. So here we have an example where the same compound isotropically will not emit polarized light and anisotropically will emit polarized light. So this was very nice. Uh, we just had one thing that we needed to check, which was the fact that the polarization did indeed result from excimers being aligned along the ribbon. And the reason for that is that, yes, it can be this, uh, but it could also be due to the presence of solvent molecules, uh, which uh, are located interstitially between the fullerene molecules. You can kind of imagine that this could have some effect. And so to check that, and I'm just going to cut a long story quite short, uh, we prepared uh, crystals of C60 that included uh, chloroform, uh, has a clathrate, uh, and verified that this actually has a very negligible effect on the polarization. So here we have it. We have three cases, the same chromophore each time, C60, and with the supramolecular interactions induced by the barbituric acid, we can control the way that the electronic uh, interactions between the molecules take place. If there's no hydrogen bonding, we have absolutely no polarization. And if we can align them through hydrogen bonding, well, we have very strong polarization. And this is actually quite nice because uh, it means that we can use and tune the, the electronic interactions through a non-covalent uh, forces. Um, but the story doesn't stop here. Uh, this is where you get these once-in-a-lifetime phone calls. And this was uh, from the um, uh, technician that was doing, taking the, the images that I showed you for the polarization. Uh, and, and the phone rings in my office. And he goes, Dario, can you come? There's something strange going on. And when you hear that, it can mean one of two things. Uh, either something is broken, uh, or there's something unexpected. And you always wish for that when you're a scientist, right? And so this is what we discovered that was unexpected. Uh, we discovered that the polarization rotated as a function of irradiation time. And there is a switch in polarization that occurs as you irradiate the crystal with the laser. And as you can see here, you start with this polarization oriented along one axis, one direction. As you hit it with the laser, the polarization goes away. So this is what we call bleaching. I mean, of course, always bleaches. But no, no. The polarization comes back after a certain point. You see, it goes away. It begins to turn, continues turning, and then comes back. And not only does it come back, but there's no change in the fluorescence emission spectra. There's no change in the intensity of the emission. And there's no change in the lifetime of the chromophore. Now, if you're a photochemist, this completely is a puzzle because it's unfathomable that you can change the direction of the chromophore without changing the chromophore itself. And you see it here quite convincingly. This is a single crystal. We fire one single laser shot on this crystal. On top is the intensity. There's nothing. You don't see anything in the intensity. But look at the polarization. You see very clearly where the laser hit. This is only one laser shot. And the emission from this point before and after is identical. So it's still eczema emission, but it's turned. So how do we rationalize something like that? Well, what we know is that the polarization turns by 60 degrees, and quite exactly and reproducibly. No change in the intensity and no change in the lifetime. Well, this is something that we figured had to do with the presence of the hydrogen bonded ribbon, because normal C60 crystals do not do that. And they don't emit polarized light to begin with. And what one possibility would be that the formation of these excimers, sure, gives you excimer-like emission. But if you recall in the intro introduction, I showed you that if you align C60, they can photodimerize. Remember that? Slide three. Here, we have the C60s that are aligned. They can photodimerize. Not efficiently, but they can. And if you look in Yiping uh, work, on photodimers of C60, uh, he actually prepared them and isolated them. And he showed that the fluorescence is actually similar to that of C60. So what we think is happening is that as we irradiate, we get emission from excimers, but we also 
photodimerize these excimers. And as these excimers are photodimerized, their energy level goes up a little bit, not much, just a little bit, enough to make them no longer the energy sink in the crystal. And because exciton diffusion is very fast in the, in the crystal, then the energy looks for another excimer. And there's another ribbon just beside there. And this other ribbon can also form an excimer. And anybody care to guess the angle between these two? Exactly 60 degrees. So we figure that this is the reason behind the, the mechanism behind this switch in uh, polarization. And we got, well, we coined the word photopolic materials uh, in analogy with photochromic materials. So a photochromic material changes color as you irradiate it, or a photopolic material will change polarization as you irradiate it. And we can use this for a number of things. One of the things is to have fun and write things, so you can tell when this was done. Uh, you can take a crystal and essentially scan the laser, and you write information that can only be read using polarization spectroscopy. And this is limited, of course, by the diffraction of light, uh, so you're limited to about 400 uh, nanometers uh, because the emission of the C60 excimers is around 800 nanometers. So this is very nice, but of course, what I showed you was modifying fullerene by putting in a hydrogen bonding group. Um, this is, of course, because fullerene is very difficult to work with because there's really no functional groups. There's no hydrogen, there's no nitrogen, there's no oxygen or anything. So if you want to recognize do molecular recognition of C60, well, the solution that we used is this one. You add functional groups. You add anchoring points. Uh, there's other people that have done other things, like Takuzo Aida, Nazario Martin, that use shape complementarity. So you take advantage of the fact that C60 is a sphere, and then you can do shape complementarity, and that can recognize it. Uh, so these are the two general approaches. Um, any other ones? It's kind of hard to think of other ones, no? You can either react with it, you can either modify it, or you can use the shape. Uh, but there is a third one. And what I thought would be a good thing to try would be to take a little used reaction now of C60, which is the reversible covalent addition of anthracene. And this was known since the very early days of C60 chemistry back in 93. I know Andreas Hirsch popularized this a lot for those that are in the field. Um, but this is a reaction that occurs quite specifically between anthracenes uh, or dienes and C60 because C60 is a good dienophile. You can do Diels-Alder reactions with C60. And Diels-Alder reactions are reversible. So here's where we're looking at the idea of reversible covalent chemistry. And if you look at some of um, Martin Saunders' work, uh, he used helium-3 NMR to investigate this reaction. And the conclusion is that the reaction is a total mess. Uh, it's a total mess because you see here, as soon as you start increasing the equivalence of dimethyl anthracene in solution, you start to form the mono adduct, then that goes away, the bis adduct comes in, goes away, tris adduct, tetra adduct, you can go all the way to eight adducts. So all of these are in equilibrium, and you can't isolate a single one of them. You can't isolate it because as soon as you put it on a column and try and purify it, the thing falls apart. So this is, of course, useless, right? Well, no, because you can use reversible covalent chemistry if you can stop, freeze the reaction at a certain point. And you can do that by compartmentalizing the reaction. So how do we do that? Well, we do the reaction in one compartment, move it quickly to another one, and now the reaction is blocked. And the easiest way to do that is on a surface. And in fact, this is really where it gets interesting, because you can do C60 chemistry on the surface. And there is a strong interest in this, because it is difficult to make C60 monolayers, compact, dense, self-assembled monolayers. You can make a covalent monolayer, but it will have holes in it, because you don't have self-assembly. The monolayer cannot deform and reform to correct the errors inherent in its formation. We can perhaps use this reversible covalent chemistry to make dense uh, self-assembled C60 monolayers and take advantage of the fact that anthracenes are generally unreactive. So they will exclusively react with C60 or C60 derivatives. And also, looking a little bit forward, we can also do lithography with anthracene. This is well known, so I'm not going to bother telling you about this. So what we thought we could do is to take advantage of the fact that the self-assembled monolayers are densely packed to try and measure the electrical conductivity 
through a single monolayer. So once again, using reversible or using supramolecular chemistry to control the way things interact electronically. And so this is the way we, we form the monolayers. It's quite easy. We just graft onto silica with anthracene. We leave a little bit of spacers because the C60 is quite bigger, much bigger than the anthracene. And then I'm not going to go into too many details, but just to show you that we do uh, significant characterization. This is spectroscopic ellipsometry. We can use it to follow the increase in thickness, exactly one nanometer, what you would expect for C60. Uh, and then what we did is that we used conducting AFM to measure the topology and also the charge carrier transport properties of the material. So we evaporated a gold electrode using a PDMS mask, so quite technical. I'll be glad to discuss that with anybody who's interested. Um, but it gives us a very clean edge on which make experiments. And then the conducting tip of the AFM is used to measure the surface as well as the IV curves at every different points. Uh, different colors that you will see represent different devices. These are two control devices with just silica, unmodified, and an octadecil uh, chain, which is non-conductive. And you see that you go from very, very low resistance when you're in contact with the electrode to basically infinite resistance when you're away from the electrode. So what happens when you have first the anthracene? Well, you find that you can see actually where the electrode is. And then you can also measure the conductivity at different distances. And what you find is that there's a distance beyond which you can't measure anymore. There's a distance at which you're touching the electrode. And in between, you have logarithmic dependence of the current with the distance, sort of something you might expect. At any one point, you can measure the IV curve. And we find non-ohmic behavior typical for what you would expect for an organic semiconductor. So that's all very nice. What about the, uh, the C60? Well, the C60 behaves similarly. We got similar response from the C60. Conducting, non-conducting, logarithmic distance behavior, nonlinear ohmic IV curves. Brilliant. What you immediately see is that the fullerene conducts much, much better than the anthracene. You can see this because already one micron away, we can still measure the electrical transport. So, we're talking about a single layer of C60 molecules, huh? not evaporated. As I mentioned, different colors are different devices. We did this on a number of them. You see them again here, plotted either according to the Schottky-Richardson equation or for a full Frankel uh, charge transport mechanism. Essentially, these are all mechanisms that charge transport mechanism that give you a logarithmic distance dependence. And this is exactly what we see. Uh, we can use this to determine the uh, dielectric constant of the material. And this is where things start to go wrong. Because we can calculate the optical dielectric constant. And you see that they're very different from what we measure experimentally using the spectroscopic ellipsometer. Hmm. Now, the fact that they're different doesn't really bother me too much. But if you look at the trend, the trend is reversed, and we don't like that, because that we can't explain the magnitude OK. But if you reverse the trend, then there's something wrong. And in fact, there's something wrong with this model. Because if you look at the IV curves, the IV curves are quadratic. And that tells you that it's space charge limited transport, except that there's a problem. Space charge limited transport is not compatible with exponential distance dependence. So here we're at odds between two models that don't agree. And this is something that I think we'll, we will see more and more for electronic organic devices. The fact that we're missing good models to describe their uh, electronic behavior. These models come from the inorganic world. We can apply them to organic materials. But as you see here, they don't necessarily work so well. We think we have some idea of why this is happening. But if anybody uh, wants to discuss this, uh, I'll be happy to, to talk about it um, in, in much more detail. So as conclusions, well, we know that the, the field is not homogeneous uh, in these devices. We know that the charge transport is space charge limited, as I mentioned. Um, what is definitely true is that we can transport charges over one micron, so quite far away 
Well, this is quite good for a single nanometer layer of organic material without a field effect, I should say. This is not a field effect transistor, huh? not OFET. So without any field effect, we can still transport charges. That's, that's, quite, that's quite good. Um, the other thing that I thought was very interesting, and I hope you'll agree with me, is this use of the reversible covalent approach. And I think that it's actually quite powerful for organic materials because many of them have double bonds. Huh? All the conjugated polymers have double bonds, and many of them are not that soluble. Wouldn't it be nice to modify them, make them soluble, reverse them and stuff? And there's one in particular that I thought that could be really cool, and that would be graphene. Can we do graphene? Why not? C60 is just rolled up ball of graphene. Carbon nanotubes are rolled up graphene. So why not graphene? Well, there is a problem. The fact is that the Diels-Alder reaction is already relatively slow with C60. And C60 is curved, so quite reactive. If you flatten it out, it's going to be even less reactive. So it's going to be even slower, and that's not good. Uh, and then, of course, the reaction is reversible. So we need a better dyeing. We need something that's more reactive. Fortunately, and I tell this to all my students, the solution is in the literature. Just go, go do the literature. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. And Eventually, we found this report by Bruce Rickburn at UCLA. And Bruce Rickburn is an organic chemist that was trying to develop a protecting group for double bonds. How can we protect a double bond during a chemical transformation? Well, he thought, let's make a Diels-Alder adduct. And so he proposed the use of anthrone and a base to generate this highly reactive dyeing, which is the anthranolate anion. You can't buy it. It's not stable. If you look on the Aldrich catalog, you can't find anthracinol. You find the tautomer, anthrone. However, there's a little bit of anthracinol in solution. And you can accelerate this reaction by putting in a little bit of a base. This is very reactive and will add to any dyeing, any, um, any al 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 alcine uh, in solution. It's funny because at the same time, and Nasario is a very good friend, so I, uh, we joke a lot about these things, and uh, Nasario was working with Fred Voodle, and if you look at the time, it's exactly the same time. He was also using anthrone, but he was using this uh, diazo derivative to add to C60, and so this is the only reported addition of anthrone to C60. But it's not what we want. This is not the Diels-Alder reaction. What we want to do is this to take anthrone, put in a bit of a base, put C60, does it react? And so I did this one summer, and I can say I because I actually go back to I don't have to teach. I'm uh, equivalent of NSERC, so CNRS, we're not obliged to teach, so I have time to go into the lab and do experiments. And I usually do the crazy experiments over the month of August when, when other people are away. And so I took anthrone, C60, and compared it with this acetylated anthracene, and the difference in reaction, in reactivity, is just excellent. Over tenfold increase. So we can use anthrone as a masked dyeing to do the reversible covalent chemistry. And it's actually quite stable adduct that we can form. <coughs> so does it work with graphene? Because that's really what I wanted to tell you about. Well, this is the work of Hugo Barres, which is a graduate student in his third year. He's quite big, rugby player. Um, and I asked him to try the reaction and to see if we could take graphene and react it and functionalize it with the Diels-Alder reaction. And there's several things here that are interesting. First of all, we are changing the sp2 orbital carbons to sp3. So they're no longer planar. This should cause the graphene sheets to come apart. Maybe we can use it to exfoliate graphene. This is something from graphite. This is something that would be very interesting. And then at the same time, we can actually functionalize it. And this, of course, you can kind of put it in perspective if you consider what's done nowadays, which is oxidation of graphene or graphite into graphene oxide, which is then reduced. But when you reduce graphene oxide, you get what people call reduced graphene oxide. And they don't call it graphene for a reason, because it's not graphene anymore. You've introduced a lot of defects. You've ruined the conjugation. You ruined the beautiful honeycomb structure that you have in front of this building every time you come in in the morning. It's all deformed. Why is that? It's because when you oxidize graphene, you make carbocations. And carbocations, all of you know, migrate. 
Dio's older adducts do not migrate, so we have that advantage. But does it work? Indeed it does, and it works brilliantly. You can take pyrolytic graphite, you buy from Aldrich, THF, Anthrone, a little bit of bass, just ultrasound. First we use the strong ultrasound, the horn. No need. Laboratory ultrasound bath works great. Only, a, only an hour, hour and a half. We can centrifuge it, remove all the things that are big, and we get very, very concentrated, well, very concentrated, fairly concentrated graphene solution. And if you look at the solvents that we can use, for those that are familiar in the field, this is quite exceptional. Because normally this is only done either in water using surfactants or in N-methylpyrrolidinone or DMF. You can't use THF. You cannot use acetonitrile. They don't work. We can even do it in isopropanol. Toluene works great. Why? Well, because we have these, I think, phenyl groups sticking out. Here's some images. Sorry, wrong way. Images of the graphene that we can exfoliate. So we have some single layer graphene as well as few layer graphene. Uh, you see here, this is, of course, a picture of your building. Uh, you can see very nicely the honeycomb of the graphene. Uh, and, of course, the fact that it has a uh, hexagonal repeat unit. Uh, I'll add that there's no Fourier transform filter that was applied to this, huh? No Photoshop. This is as provided. This is good, but we can go farther than that. The mask dyeing approach, I think, is actually quite powerful because we can use it with substituted anthrones. I'll show you that in a moment, but you can extend it. So, Anthrone is the mask dyeing of anthracene. We can take tetracinol instead of tetracine. Who's worked with pentacine? It's horrible. As soon as you open it, it'll go immediately turn dark. You have to work with it in a glove box. Here, we have pentacinone. Pentacinone is stable. It's a white solid. It doesn't absorb light, it doesn't get oxidized, because we only have two naphthalenes. When we, only when we prepare the pentacinolate anion do we actually get pentacine. And we can go even farther. Why not heptacine? We can do that. Uh, I'll say it, we haven't done it yet, uh, but I'm sure we can do it because Hugo's working on it at the moment. In the meantime, we have made the pentacine one, and it works just as well. And why shouldn't it? It's a masked dyne as well. And its reactivity is a little bit better than that of anthrone, uh, probably simply because the electron density is a little bit higher. It can also exfoliate graphene, so nothing surprising there. And we can also use it, well, uh, sorry, before I get onto that, we can also characterize, we also characterize the materials um, in terms of the defects. So remember what I said about the graphene oxide, that when you generate graphene oxide, you can't reduce it completely to graphene because the uh, carbocations and the defects migrated. The deals also, they should not migrate. And we verified this. We, what we did is that we used Raman spectroscopy. So Raman spectroscopy is a very useful tool to characterize graphene. And you have some very characteristic bands. So the 2D band will give you some clues about how many graphene sheets are stacked. Uh, the G band is the resonance of the in-plane graphene. And then there's a D band, which is generally associated to the presence of SP3 defects. And if you look in the exfoliated graphene that we produce, we have very strong D bands, so a lot of SP3 defects. And this is kind of like what you would expect, right? We did covalent modification uh, of the graphene. So we expect that we put the, the defects there. But if we heat it under vacuum, the diels alder reaction should reverse. And the uh, anthrone is a small molecule, so it should evaporate. And so we did that. And this is actually performed using a confocal Raman uh, microscope so that we can actually follow the Raman signal of a single graphene flake while we heat it. And what happens as we heat it, around 150 degrees, right about where you would expect the diels alder reaction to revert, the D-band goes away because the sp3 defects have been removed. And we think that this is actually quite cool because it means that we can take graphite, exfoliate it with the anthro, functionalize it if need be, and then when you 
make an electrode, when you put it into as a material and you're ready to use it, you just heat it under vacuum and all the anthrone on the surface will go away. And you will be able left with near pristine graphene, unlike what you have with the graphene oxide. There is a catch. The, I said the anthrone on the surface will go away. Well, what happens to the anthrone that's trapped underneath? Uh, well, that one will not go away because, of course, it would have to pass either through the graphite or through the, the graphene or through the electrode, which is not going to happen. So you will end up with trapped anthrone, uh, but we don't think that this is necessarily an issue. It just depends what type of application you're looking for. So we think that this is actually quite, quite interesting. How much am I doing for time here? Okay, not too bad. Um, so then the last thing I wanted to tell you about was the work that we've been doing with the um, high-resolution OLEDs. And I know a lot of people here work on them, and so that's why I thought that maybe uh, it's something that would interest you. I'm going to say right away we're not specialists in the field. Uh, we're amateurs. Uh, as you see, I hope one thing that I've showed you is that we have an incredible amount of fun doing the research I'm showing. So this is another project where we had a lot of fun, and this is something. So. Um, of course, OLEDs are important because we need screens everywhere, and um, I guess everybody here has a smartphone, so I don't need to ask that. Uh, how many have an iPhone? Okay, a few iPhones. How many chose Samsung instead? Not that many. Nobody will, nobody will admit to it. Uh, well, Samsung is quite interesting because you might know they are the ones that use OLEDs for their phones. Uh, okay, Eric has a Samsung. And if you put an iPhone and an OLED or a LCD screen and an OLED screen next to each other, you'll immediately see the difference. The OLED screen is brighter, better contrast. Uh, it will actually use less current because it only lights up the pixels that it needs to and not everything. Uh, and you can view it from a large viewing angle. So there are inherent advantages to OLEDs. And in fact, Apple in, you know, would like to use OLED displays. The two problems, of course, is that the OLEDs are made by Samsung, which won't produce them for Apple. And then there is a resolution problem. What Apple can say, so here I show the iPhone 4, but it's true for the iPhone 5, iPhone 6. Apple has incredible resolution using the LCD technology, much, much higher than can be attained with the OLEDs. Because there's a small problem with the OLEDs is that you need to evaporate the organic molecules, and they are intolerant of impurities. So as soon as you have a little bit of contamination of one color into another, well, we have energy transfer, all sorts of spectroscopic and photophysical things happen, and your pixel changes color and emits the color of the contaminant. And that's not good. So you have to have higher separation between the pixels. Uh, of course, you have some advantages with the OLEDs because of they're efficient, like I said, but you can bend them. They're lightweight. You've seen the TVs now that are made with OLED displays. They're absolutely brilliant. Um, but the resolution, well, it's limited with the top-down approach because we need to prepared them through a mask. And here is really the problem. The problem is the mask and the shadow effect of the mask. So can we solve that as chemists? And as supramolecular chemists, of course, what we always like to say is like, oh, bottom up is much, much better than top down. Right, but why don't we have any bottom up devices then on the market? Well, because they don't work so well, right? Uh, so it's really something that's a struggle to get to work. Um, what we would like to do, what we try to do, and this is done in collaboration with Ken Sung Wong, which is professor at NTU in, in Taiwan, so a, a friend that I met at, well, a friend from Strasbourg that we've been collaborating since, uh, since a while now, which is to use self-assembly to determine the resolution of these types of devices. And so um, at the very beginning, we began taking electroactive materials. So here's the pi conjugated materials that you are accustomed to seeing. And this is the work uh, by Spins, who's very surprised on that picture. He just woke up and discovered he was married. <laughs> and we took these and we appended them with hydrogen bonding molecular recognition groups. So you see the same theme over and over again right in this issue. We take something that's electroactive, photoactive, and we modify it. We give hydrogen bonding molecular recognition properties. Now these, the ones that I'm showing you here are called biorets, and they've been used already by several people. I, I took out some of the slides because otherwise it would, the presentation would be too long. Uh, I'll just give some credit to uh, um, Bert Meyer's group that originally invented this ureopyrimidone type molecular recognition unit. Uh, and you see that the one that I'm showing you today is actually quite similar. We have donor-donor acceptor, donor-donor acceptor here. Um, 
this one comes back, bites its tail. Uh, there is a big difference. And the difference is that in Meyer's system, they have this carbon residue here where we don't have it in the BioRed system. And that makes all the difference. It seems silly, but it really makes a huge difference. Let me explain why. If you have the system here, this can form complementary hydrogen bonding motif with itself. And so it will make linear things. And linear things make fibers. And in fact, all the systems that people have been investigating to date are fibers. They're gels. If you look at the literature on gels, it's huge. There's many of them. And so here's this compound. It forms gels. Now, gels are interesting. Don't get me wrong. You can make fibers. You can call them cables. They can have electronic communications. Fantastic. But by unlocking the other molecular recognition phase, what we do is that we make sheets. And if you know a little bit about biology, you know that sheets are what makes cell walls and what makes vesicles and all these things. And so that's why we thought that this motif, here's the crystal structure, you see the hydrogen bonded sheets. This motif would be different. And indeed it was. This is where it pays to have a little bit of inspiration over perspiration. Uh, if you take this compound, this compound spontaneously forms vesicles in THF. And there's two things important there. First is the word spontaneous. This is quite rare, there's not many compounds that spontaneously form vesicles. They'll spontaneously form micelles, but not vesicles. A few of them are the phosphotriglycerides that make up our cell walls. Other ones are the polymersomes. So those will make vesicles spontaneously. But small molecules that make vesicles, not so many out there. And then the other important point is that it's done in anhydrous organic media. No water added. Do not add water. Water makes no difference here. You don't need biphasic separation to form vesicles. So if you take this molecule, dissolve it in THF at 10 to the minus 4, and just drop cast it on any substrate, this is what you see. And you can close up, and you see that you have little spheres. And if you close up even more, sometimes the spheres are joined by little filaments. And there are times when the spheres break during the deposition. And so now we can see inside, and we can see that the inside is hollow. And that's how we know that there are spheres. So this is quite good. And the compound actually remains highly fluorescent. So it has a fluorescence quantum yield of 96%, which is extremely high for condensed matter aggregate. Usually you have exciton quenching when you use condensed matter. But this is not the case here. So can we use this to make high definition OLED? And you see already where I'm getting to. We're going to take the little spheres, and we're going to use the little spheres as pixels. So that would be great. So what do we need to do that? Well, first thing that we need, of course, are colors, right? Nobody wants a black and white display or a blue and, and black display. And so with Ken, uh, we made, designed these other compounds. So here's the blue emitting compound. You see the emission spectrum here. This one, we just added a uh, benzothiomidazole group. And so this gives us a cross-conjugated adduct that sort of shifts everything a little bit to the red. And here we have a real donor acceptor system. And so, of course, this is quite red emitting. The emission efficiency stays quite high. So 85% for the green-yellow and, well, around 60, 65% for the red, which is quite good for red. Huh? It's, it's difficult to have highly emitting red compounds. Uh, of course, the crucial question is whether they form vesicles or not. Because, as you see, we kept the same principle, the same design principle. Electroactive moiety, molecular recognition group. So it worked here, but does it work here, and does it work here? And we were very fortunate, because it did. And here are scanning electron microscope images at different magnifying ratio. So you can see very nicely here that we have the spheres. Here, likewise, a little bit more polydispersed. Red, even more so. Uh, the size is the same. This is 500 nanometers. The scale bar here is 1 micron. Here is 3 microns. But you see that they're a little bit more polydispersed. And we think that actually, retrospectively, this is probably due to the enhanced flexibility in this unit with respect to the polyphenols of the other one. Then we went back to see our colleague uh, that works with a confocal microscope, and we were able to measure the emission spectra of individual vesicles. So not anymore looking at the bulk, but looking at single vesicle at a time. Uh, here are the blue vesicles, the yellow vesicles, the red vesicles. And these are the spectra from individual vesicles. And you see that we don't have any shift. 
the shift is actually very small with respect to what we have in solution, between five and seven nanometers. So the blue actually still emits quite nicely blue colored light. It's cut off here because we have a 400 or 380 nanometer filter to filter out the, the excitation wavelength. Uh, but the other ones are, are spot on. Uh, now, of course, these colors you can arrange on a chromatic diagram, and they're not optimized. They're not perfect, but even with that, you see that we're doing pretty well. The blue is exceptionally good blue. The red is fairly good, too. Eh, the yellow could be a bit more green. We will should shift it out a little bit more towards uh, longer wavelengths. Uh, the actual colors are shown here in white, and I put the chromatic gamut for an LCD display here, and you see that already with this first generation molecules, we're already covering about 80% of that. So it's already quite good. Uh, and more importantly, we're covering the little triangle here, which is white. Now, I don't know why, but white seems to be the holy grail of people that are working on uh, th these types of displays. So, like, why not? We can do white. Of course we can do white. We can control energy transfer inside the aggregates. What, all we need to do is to make an aggregate in which we have a certain cocktail, a certain recipe uh, of blue, yellow, and red, and it should emit white. It should emit white provided that all the colors are well dispersed in the aggregate. And they should be well dispersed, or we think they will be well dispersed, because of the compatibility induced by the molecular recognition motif. So since they're all the same, well then, they should all join up together. So we did that. We took the blue vesicles, started adding in a bit of yellow. You see that we moved over here along the line. At a certain point, we began adding red, so the line shifted. We went overboard, went back, and eventually, sure enough, a bit of mind-numbing trial and error, I'll gladly admit it, uh, we actually are able to obtain very nice, very clean D65 white. Very clean because it actually covers the whole spectrum. It's not just the sum of blue, yellow, and green. We actually have very nice emission. We can do statistical analysis on these things. Uh, and here's a selection of over 400 spectra. And you see that the emission is nicely centered on white, and it's actually quite monodispersed. So it's really, they're very, very nicely behaved. Uh, I haven't said it, but they're actually very stable. You can irradiate them for a long time. Um, of course, this is not how devices work, right? Uh, so far, I haven't said anything about an OLED device. I haven't said anything about a light-emitting device. This is just simply luminescence. To make a light-emitting device, we need to have something which is stable towards oxidation and reduction and that can transport charges. So we investigated that by using Kelvin force atomic force, Kelvin probe atomic force microscopy, so KPFM. And if you just use AFM, if you just concentrate on the AFM image, here's three vesicles that are aligned, a line drawn through them, and you see them here. And one thing that you'll immediately notice is that, well, they're about 200, 300 nanometers wide, so that's exactly what we expect, but they're not very high. They're only 30 nanometers high. Why is that? Well, because when you put them on the surface, the vesicles deflate. And now you don't have a vesicle anymore. You don't have a sphere. You have a pancake. So when I give this in France, it's a crepe. But here in Canada, it will be, or North America, it will be a pancake. So we have pancakes. Pancakes are good because pancakes are round and they're thin. So we don't have to transport charges very far before they meet and annihilate and generate light. Are they stable, though? Can we generate charges? And are the charges stable irrespective of the presence of the hydrogen bonds? Because, of course, hydrogen bonds are acidic. They can react with uh, anions, carbanions. So we can use the tip of the conducting AFM to charge up the particle. And then we can go over it and see whether the charges are still localized on the particle. And so we did that for positive charges, and we did that for negative charges, and we also investigated how long the charges remain on the pancakes before they diffused away, before they disappeared. And in fact, you see that they're actually very stable. So here's the KFM. After 15 minutes, you still have over half the charges localized on the aggregate. It means, this is on an insulating substrate, of course, it means that the compound doesn't react. It's quite stable. So this is, this is very good. Um, the thing that we need to do now, and this is what we're working on, is to make a device that actually emits light. And this will be a first, because we're actually looking for light emission from a single aggregate, 
a single aggregate that's sub-micron dimension, possibly around 200 to 250 nanometers across. So we did that by modifying the confocal setup so that we have an electrode on top. Uh, we used e-beam lithography to make interdigitated electrodes that were only 100 nanometers apart so that we could actually contact both sides of the aggregate. Uh, and this is work done by Yutang Tsai, uh, that's now postdoc in my group. And we then would drop cast vesicles on here, wait for them to form pancakes, and then connect up the voltage and see if any of them light up. And here's the results. They light up. We have light. This is the electrodes. This is the field of vesicles. You see that if you close up, you find numerous cases where some of the vesicles lodge between the electrodes. Why not? You know, they should. And then here are the electrodes that are actually observed using the confocal microscope. And what you see actually is not the 100 meters, 100 nanometer separation is the diffraction due to the separation, but you see quite nicely the, where the two electrodes overlap. And here is the dark field image when you, we apply a voltage of about 2.5 volts. And you see that two of them lit up. And if you look where they lit up, they lit up exactly between the two electrodes. We turned them off, applied again, and one of them turned up again. And that was it. And then they died. And then they died because, of course, they're not very stable between the electrodes. And this is exposed to air. Not great. Except I'm organic chemist, you know, where this is far outside our comfort zone as far as knowledge. Uh, the other issue here is that I told you that the pancake was flat, so it would be good to transport charges through it, but we're transporting them across the pancake, over 200 nanometers. That's a lot. That's a lot of organic material to transport through. What we would really like to do is to make a device like this. We put the pancakes in solution, the vesicles in solution, deposit them, and then make a bilayer device. And that would be good. That's really what we want to do. But can we do it? And here, it's a little bit difficult because we have to be able to deposit the electrodes and have to avoid short circuits between them. Um, it turns out that it is actually possible. Uh, and we have done it. And what we did is that we used a polymerizable hole transport layer that we put on the ITO to avoid the short circuits. And so then we can deposit the vesicles coating on top and here are the actual devices. I'm sorry, I have better pictures now, but I didn't have time to, to modify the slides. Uh, but you see, this is the, the white. I have to look to see what the red, the green, and the blue. This is the actual emission spectra. And we prepared an OLED that was white. And here is the emission of the white OLED. This is no longer using excitation. This is real OLED device with the material that I showed you. The only question is, of course, do I have a film or do I actually have vesicles that are emitting? That's what you're probably asking yourself, right? We have vesicles. And this is the confocal microscope image, electroluminescence, so no longer fluorescence excitation. You see very clearly the vesicle field. This is what you see with the naked eyes. Quite, they're quite bright. Huh? But this is what you see under the microscope. And you can close up on one of these, and you can get the EL spectrum of a single aggregate. We can measure the full width, half height, half max. Well, it's about 400 nanometers in this case. Uh, some of them are a little bit lower, but they're, of course, once again, limited by the diffraction limit of the light. They're limited by the diffraction limit, but that's not the limit of the resolution, of course. The resolution can go much beyond. So these, I forgot to label them. This is the blue, the green, the red, and the white. Uh, this is the size distribution determined using the cofocal microscope. And this is the size distribution determined using an AFM on a half-layer device. So before we put the top electrode on top. And there's some great things here. Uh, we know that the flas vesicles flatten into disks. The diameter from AFM is between 250 and 500 nanometers. So if we say we need three colors to make RGB emission, well, we need three pixels. Even if you want, I don't know, one micron between each dot, we can still have a voxel that's about five mi less than five microns across. That could translate into 5,000 DPI resolution. What is it good for? No idea. But maybe for future implantable devices, that would be good. For microscopes, that might be interesting. The material is exceedingly stable, even without encapsulation. So this is quite good and quite bright. Uh, of course, what we need are to make different colors. And that's really where we're a bit 
you know, struggling now on, but we can make, we can measure the color from the individual aggregates here, and I've put them here, so the blue, the green, the red, and the white, and then we had a stroke of luck. And this is when you're having a good student or a good postdoc can really make a difference for the PI. And we had tried to make different devices by, different color devices by mixing the vesicles and then putting them down. But like I mentioned, the compatibility is very good and the materials mix very well. And you don't need much contamination for energy transfer to work well. Uh, but nonetheless, he tried. He spun coat one color, spun coat another color, and then a third color. And this is what we got. We got three different colors next to one another. So here's the first example of a bottom-up electroluminescent device where we have the three colors that you would like to have, the blue, the green, and the red. Eh, we're losing a little bit on the green. We probably have a little bit of contamination there, uh, but something that we need to work on, something that I think we can solve. So this is actually something quite cool for uh, if you're an organic chemist like me to be able to say like, well, look, we actually made something that works uh, when you apply electricity to it. So um, it's been a great time. It's been really a lot of fun. Uh, this is really what I wanted to tell you. Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, I'm not going to go through and bore you with conclusions and stuff. I'm just going to show you a conclusion where that uh, uh, Bordeaux is a really nice place to do research. Uh, it's a fun place. Uh, here's a few pictures. Here's where it is for those of you that have not been there. So I'll remind the, those that have not been there that University of Waterloo has a strong uh, collaborative scientific ties with the University of Bordeaux. Many students from Waterloo have come to Bordeaux. Many students from Bordeaux have come to Waterloo. And maybe you have met some of them or known some of them. Uh, so Bordeaux is here. It seems like a long distance from Paris, but it's not because we have three hours with the TGV or one hour by plane. We're very close to Spain, very close to the coast, so you can enjoy the coast. Uh, of course, Bordeaux is an old town, lots of old stones, uh, very beautiful town. Uh, this is what it's perhaps best known for, which is the red wine. Bordeaux red wine is uh, deservedly favored uh, and has a great um, reputation, very well deserved, I, I have to say. Um, I'd also like to thank the, the people that, that, that worked on me. I showed the pictures of the, most of the people that worked on the project already. I'd like to really give them credit. Uh, I'd like to mention also Professor Andre Del Guerzo that runs the confocal microscope in our group. Um, without his support, it would have been very difficult to show you the beautiful images that I did, that I did show. And then um, for the molecular electronics, we also collaborate with Guillaume Wans and uh, Lionel Hirsch in the IMS. And I mentioned these people already. This is the coast, actually, so very beautiful. It's, the water's cold, but I think if you're Canadian, you might find it warm, so it's, it's all right. Uh, I find it cold. I'm Italian. Uh, I'd also like to thank all of these people for the, the generous funding that, that, that I've received because without it, of course, you know, it's less fun to do research on a shoestring budget than it is when you have a uh, bit better funds. And uh, once again, thank you for the invitation and thank you for your attention. And if I have any questions. <laughs> So I hope you agree that research is fun. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. It's a fascinating talk. Uh, time passed, but I didn't realize it. You gave a very good talk. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, intrigued by your fluorine work. Do you observe any, because it's entropic driven process assembly, right? Do you get UCST in terms of the temperature dependent behavior? Um, temperature dependent behavior. Yeah. We haven't looked in very much detail on the temperature be, uh, behavior. We've done a lot of kinetic experiments, um, but the temperature dependence, we haven't looked at it. Uh, I would expect it to have a negative temperature dependence because, of course, the entropy is working against you on it. Uh, yes, um, the molecular recognition motif is conjugated to the, uh, the electronic core. Uh, and so it actually imparts a little bit of donor acceptor character to it. So it shifts the absorption a little and the emission a little bit to the red uh, with respect to just the oligophenylene core. Uh, however, the electronic properties of the material 
in solution, dilute in solution, and in the vesicles are very, very similar, maybe four or five nanometer shift. Uh, and the reason we think that this is, this is a little bit surprising. Normally when you condense matter, they interact. Uh, remember, these are spiral compounds because they're uh, fluorines. And so we think that there's not very good overlap, not enough to form excimers that you might have with some of the fluorine derivatives. Do you have any idea about what the structure of this is? Yes, uh, we have some ideas. I, I took out a lot of things, but uh, we have some fairly uh, advanced ideas. Uh, we've done uh, neutron scattering um, and then uh, small angle uh, and large angle uh, X-ray scattering. Uh, we know that the vesicles are present in solution before that they are formed in the solid. So we know that when we dissolve the material in THF, it will spontaneously organize into vesicles and it doesn't happen during evaporation of the solvent. Uh, and we know that the, if you look at the DLS at different angles, uh, there's the motion of the vesicles is Brownian. There's no interaction between the vesicles. From this and the fact that TEM images, which I did not show, uh, and the neutron diffraction that I did not show, it tells us that the vesicle are very thin shell, and we know that because also when they deposit flat, they're only 30 nanometers, we think that the material is organized planar to the surface of the vesicles with the hydrogen bonds along the surface. If the hydrogen bonds were exposed normal to the surface, we would expect the vesicles to bind one to the other and to have interactions, and we do not see this. So I have a lot of information I can share with you on that, if, uh, if you're interested. No? For the polarization of the, um, of the, um, no, of the, of the fluids. So first, they are polarized in one direction, and then they are polarized 60 degrees. So why don't you see both polarization at the very beginning? Uh, because, well, uh, again, there I cut a long story, a little bit short. Um, we have three possible, if you look at, examine the crystal structure, there are three different eczemers that can form. Each of them is 60 degrees with respect to the other. And if you look at the interfullerene distance, one of them is a little bit shorter than the other. And we think that the stability of these eczemers is not the same. The one with the shortest distance is a little bit more stable than the other ones. Because you also said that um, the presence in density doesn't change when you do the experiment. So now, when you, when you say that they, for the shorter ones, they dimerize, and then I would have thought they would not emit, and then that's it. Yeah. Uh, Is it delayed the emission? No, no, it's not. It's not um, I, I regret taking out the, the slide that uh, explained exactly that. Um, because I, I was afraid that it was just going to get a little bit too long for. OK, so you see it here. Um, if you look at the crystal structure, so these are the crystal structure. Uh, I highlighted three possible excimers that can form. Uh, one is oriented along the ribbon, and two of them are between two different ribbons. All of them are at 60 degrees. Uh, I always showed you this one. Has been, and I, maybe I led you to believe that this is the one that actually emits, but it's not. We don't think it is. Uh, if you cut through the two fullerenes and look at them, you see that this one has no double bonds that can undergo photodimerization. This one should be totally unreactive towards photodimerization. These two can photodimerize. And between these two, you see that this one actually has the shortest distance, actually by quite a bit between the other two. So we think that this is the excimer that's initially populated because it has the lowest energy. Not by much, because otherwise we would see a difference in the emission profile. But we think that this is the energy sink here. This one then can undergo, is, photo, is expected to be photoreactive because it has six, six double bonds that can uh, photodimerize. They're in close proximity. When this photodimerizes, it raises the energy of this fullerenes above that of these two excimers then one of these two becomes the emissive ex eczemer. I don't know which one. Uh, I would expect that it's this one for two reasons. The fullerenes are closer here than they are here. And then when we did, so that's the one that would, should work. Uh, when we measured the emission anisotropy on needle-like crystals, uh, where we think that the fullerenes are organized along the linear, uh, we, we see that initially the emission is oriented at 60 degrees. So we, we have 
quite a little bit of information about which way the, the fullerenes are oriented. They still em no after dimerization they will emit as fullerenes so they, they will not emit excimer emission anymore. This is uh, Yi Ping Sun's work in Clemenson. So how do you reconcile the fact that the excimer emission doesn't change in intensity? Because the emission is very similar um, in in energy and in spectral overlap. The if if it's similar in spectral overlap it means that it has similar electronic structure. Uh, they're both fullerene excimers, and so they look both like fullerenes excimers. Uh, there are just very small differences between them. Um, it's a good point. The, the other question could be, well, is there any other material that could possibly have the same properties? Perhaps. I have no idea. Uh, but I certainly can't think of one. Any oh. other questions? So you, you carbon six Um, not easily, but once we manage to grow it, we can grow them. The, the, most, the smaller crystals are the most perfect ones. So they're not large. By and large, they're about 100 microns across. And the crystal structure, we had to go to the synchrotron, use synchrotron radiation to determine it. So you, you grow crystal by the supersaturation solution? Yeah. That's the yeah, that's yeah. The uh, or by vapor diffusion, I have and to check. What but. The Lousy. In, in, in low concentration solutions? Uh, fairly lousy. The solubility is that of C60, which is not very soluble, plus that of barbituric acid, which is not very soluble either. So we have to grow the crystals from mixed solvents with uh, toluene and DMSO. The, the material is not soluble in toluene, and it's not soluble in orthodichlorobenzene. But if you add a little bit of DMSO, it breaks up the hydrogen bonding, and then, whoop, then it goes into solution. That's Normally, yes. So after modify, it's not soluble? Not well anymore, no. So even if you go to very low concentration? Uh, I don't know, maybe a little low concentration. Have you tried? You know, mm, have to go back and ask. You ask test the I don't have any solubility data apart from the fact that it's not soluble. <laughs> or at least not very soluble. I, I'm, I mean, not, I mean nothing is totally insoluble, right? So even limestone and your rocks are soluble to some degree, so I'm sure some of it will go into solution. Uh, I probably suspect it to be hydrogen bonded to form small clusters and things. Mm. Okay. Uh, no questions from students? No questions. I'll uh, ask you to join me in, in thanking Dario for a beautiful lecture. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>